I was born to a beekeeping family. My father was a farmer's son who actually was very sick during about the 1918 when the flu epidemic was around and he was uh, confined to bed for long periods of time and, and in that time he started reading agricultural magazines and particularly the bee section in the agricultural magazines and that, that sparked his interest in beekeeping as a, as a way of life. In about 1925, as far as I'm aware, uh, first started with bees. In about 1933 or 34, he built up about 80 hives of bees. The government inspectors come in and found two or three hives of disease in them and burnt the lot. And I think that really knocked him back. Uh, his whole asset base was gone. He'd, he'd started to rebuild. Uh, we were very fortunate. We had a, uh, a Chev truck. A 1939 Chev truck was uh, a bit of a prized possession in those days because most people didn't have a vehicle at all. They called him up, that's right, uh, to go to war, and, and he went before the board in Waimati, and, and they deemed the fact that he was a beekeeper. He was more valuable being a beekeeper than he would be in the war effort because we weren't getting any sugar from the UK because of the shipping. And so they said to him, you go home and produce twice as much honey uh, and make that your war effort because mm -hmm. uh, we really need honey. Uh, and then in the second breath they said, and by the way, we're going to confiscate your truck probably. And he, he said, my parting shot was, well, you want me to double my production, yet you want to take away my truck. You know, how can I do this? Yeah. And they said, oh, well, you know, we'll consider that. So they never ever took his truck away, but they, he lived with this cloud over his head all through the war that they were going to come and take his truck away. You know. He eventually made it, and he grew to having 600 hives of bees, which was a big beekeeper in those days. Later on, my father was uh, deemed to be a successful beekeeper, and, and uh, he was employed as a part-time inspector for the Ministry of Agriculture. He was probably uh, the biggest and most successful beekeeper in Waimati, which gave us a lot of pride as kids growing up, you know, so, uh, and, he'd, and he'd done it the hard way, he, like, he didn't get anything easy, which, which taught us those sorts of values too, that uh, you're not going to get anything for nothing. John McKenzie, he, he basically was a delegated beekeeper to the day he died, he said he didn't want to do anything else, never wanted to do any house, didn't care if he didn't make any money. As long as he made as much money as somebody pushing a shovel on the council, he was quite happy, and I didn't have to go to work every day. So that was his attitude. He just loved beekeeping. He, he lived for his bees and he lived for his family. I don't know about the early days, but I, from my recollections, I, at two or three years old, my father used to take me out to the shed at night, and he'd sit me up on a box on the bench and talk to me while he was wiring frames and making beekeeping equipment. He used to spend every evening out there making stuff, and he'd take me out to talk to because he found it too lonely out there, so he'd always take me out and sit me on a box. And as I got, <coughs> as I got a wee bit bigger, he'd let me put the tacks in the frames for, the, for holding the wires, so I'd be up there the wee tack hammer putting a tack in each corner, <laughs> and he'd wire it. And then as time went on, I was you know, relegated to, to be able to wire a frame and that became the bane of my life. Then I, as I got older, I was expected to wire frames and I got paid a penny a frame for wiring them. I left home when I was about 17. I worked for my father from 15 to 17. So I left and worked for a couple of other commercial beekeepers. And Milton, my brother, he took over from my place and he stayed with my father for the next 15 years or something. Uh, until it went round full circle and we come back together again and we formed this company here called Mackenzie Bee Lines in Waimati, which was the fifth, fifth largest beekeeping operation in New Zealand yeah. at the time. So Milton and I run that company, Mackenzie Bee Lines, for this part of 10 years. In the meantime, I'd worked for commercial beekeepers. Then I was appointed as a, uh, an apicultural officer for MAF. So I was about five or six years as an apiary instructor in Gore. In Gore. Uh, our base was here. We had about 1,500 hives here. We had about 1,000 in Southland, in, in Tapanui and Roxburgh district. 
and uh, we had another uh, thousand up around Taras and, and uh, Amarama area. So we had it split into three geographic districts so that we, we were more confident of getting a honey crop which are without a failure. I had a massive accident. Uh, fell off a stack of boxes in the shed up there and, and smashed my spine and in about 1974, somewhere there, what's 74, 75, and that put me off, uh, out of it, because I couldn't no longer do any lift. So Milton, my brother, carried on with the company here, and we employed staff to, to, to assist him. That changed my whole outlook because I couldn't do the heavy lifting. So I was actually talking to a MAF officer who I was work, working closely with from Omaru, and he'd just come back from Papua New Guinea. And uh, he said, oh, there's a great opportunity out there, but he says, I don't know where we're going to get anybody to go out there and train these people, you know, it's a good, good project. So I thought, you might be looking at him, and he says, oh, you wouldn't give up what you've got here. And I said, oh, you might be surprised. So it's warm, I could use my head, uh, and there's labour there to do the lifting. I don't need to do that heavy lifting. I spent all my 30 years basically uh, in Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, uh, Samoa, Fiji, Niue Island, all the South Pacific Islands teaching beekeeping. <laughs>